Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Fall 2019 Honors Lecture Series. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. Today will be uh, the first day of two days dedicated to student presentations, and I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker uh, today, one of, one of our students here in this class, one of our very own honor students, Gareth Laffley who is a transfer student from Volunteer State Community College, uh, who has a great passion for creating music for films. And we're going to learn a little bit about that passion and I think come to appreciate what the work that he's done and the things uh, in which he is currently engaged. Uh, Gareth is a marketing major and an honors and business administration minor. He's planning to graduate in August of 2020. Um, he has agreed to share with us a, a documentary that, that he produced and then to talk with us about his thesis, which is titled Real Narratives Benefit Native Peoples and Sustainable Tourism, The Culture Connection Between Native American Culture and Travel Marketing, uh, which he wrote under the direction of Dr. Carol Van West. So if you would please join me in welcoming our speaker, Gareth Lafley. Well, thank you, Dr. Phillips, and thank you everyone for having me here today. It uh, feels great to switch roles a little bit in this class and to become up here and to uh, just add to this wonderful team of presenters that we've had this semester. I'd love if we could all give a round of applause to Dr. Phillips and all the team for making this a wonderful year. So today I'm gonna to be showing you a film that uh, is something that I worked on with a few different production companies and uh, did all the music for. And what I'm gonna do as well is walk you through a little bit of the process of how it went from being a passion and an idea in a very small stage to partnering with a hundred million dollar company in Washington DC and then recording with George Lucas's symphony in California. And it all went from having a passion for something. And one thing that I always advocate is we're all here in school for a reason. And whether that's to get a job, just to make money, or if it's to better yourself, there's always a passion that drives that. So what I encourage each and every one of you to do is to think a little bit about your passions while you watch this documentary and see how you can use those to create something beneficial for your communities. This project is called Spirit Song, and it features uh, several different interviews from Native American elders from around the country. The basis behind this project is there's a Native American story behind almost every major tourist location within the United States. And those stories often get buried. So what we wanted to do through this project is to unearth these stories, to tell the true, authentic narratives of the people that were here before us, so that we can appreciate the cultural significance of what we have today. I'm very excited to have partnered as well with my co-producer Lance Bendixson on this project and the actor Wes Studi, who this year became the very first Native American actor to win an Oscar. So we're very excited to have him on board as well. So I'd like to share with you now, this is the documentary film, Spirit Song. Before I begin to tell you a little bit more about the, the project itself, I want to talk to you a little bit about the inspiration behind everything that I do and the reason why projects like this have really come about for me. I spoke a little bit in the very beginning about how you have to find something you're passionate about and to be able to use that to make a difference in someone's life. When I was 14 years old, I was taking this flute around uh, different hospitals and nursing homes in Sumner County and playing Native American flute for patients from room to room. And I came into this one woman's room and she was completely blind and almost completely deaf. But I still wanted to try and use music to reach her. The film talks about music being a universal language, something that can connect with people on a very special level. So I started to play for her and I didn't get any response. So I stepped a little bit closer and I continued to play, but she still couldn't hear what I was saying or what I was doing. So then I took this flute and I stepped up right to the edge of her bed and I started to play Amazing Grace. And in that moment, she opened her eyes 
She looked up toward the ceiling and said, I was lost, but now I'm found. Music has the ability to reach people on a very special level. But more importantly than that, it's this passion that drives us. It's this passion that moves us forward to be able to make those ripples that can carry across an entire pond with just one stone's throw. So this project, to me, tells the Native American story and the very first step that we have to do to be able to talk about this connection that we have to the earth and to these destinations is we have to debunk this false identity of what Native American culture actually is. As I mentioned in my thesis and the short title that I refer to it as is the culture connection. So when we look at this, Hollywood has given us these images of the stereotypical Native American figure. And for the most part, all of those images are incorrect. We've talked a lot in this lecture series about people that have been denied the right to vote and how that's been suppressed. And in Native American culture going along with that, their very culture itself was taken away from them. I remember being a, uh, told a story by an elder, and he said there was a little girl that went to a school, and this was on her reservation, and she was taught a traditional word in her language. She came home running into the kitchen so excited to tell her grandmother that she learned one of their traditional words, and the grandmother smacked her across the face and knocked her down. So the girl went back to school, learned another traditional native word. She came back the next day, Grandmother smacked her in the face again. And the third day, the little girl comes home and she asks her and says, Grandma, why do you keep hitting me when I speak our language? Grandmother lifted up a hand that was missing two fingers. She said, the first time that I spoke one of my native words in school, the second time I spoke one of my native words in school, they took that finger too. The third time I learned. These are the stories that you won't find in history books. These are the things that we can get through our personal interviews with these elders. That's why projects like this, to me, mean so much. Because there are these stories that need to be told, these experiences that need to be relived and to be told through film, through music, through artwork, through different things that people can connect with that don't even speak the same language as us. The flute itself has an amazing history to it and is quite a story in itself. Uh, the Native American flute dates back about 3,000 years in North America, the oldest being the Anastasi flutes of the Southwest. This type of flute is roughly 350 years old, and it's based off of the Kiowa love flute. So traditionally, Native men of the tribes would sit outside of the huts or the teepees of the women and play flute for them at night. And if a woman liked the sound of the flute playing and came out to see who was playing the flute, then that meant she had to marry whoever that person was which could be a good surprise. <laughs> or if you're like me and you have to uh, shop at Walmart late at night sometimes, uh, it could be a bad surprise. <laughs> but the flutes have brought people together for many years and they've touched a lot of lives. And the reason we know about them today is after a native man would get married, he would wrap up his flute in a blanket and hide it somewhere. Because if he got caught playing the flute, he was looking for something else. So there's a lot of flutes that have actually been turning up from the 1800s perfectly intact. I had the pleasure of playing one that was made in 1890 one time. And it's amazing to see these, uh, these flutes on this journey that they've, they've come along with. So I'd like to share with you a little bit of traditional Native American flute playing to hear what the old style would have sounded like and then go into something a little less traditional as well. Thank you. So I was originally born and raised here in Tennessee, but my family is all originally from Maine, and I'm descended from the Mi'kmaq people. And the Mi'kmaq are people uh, of Maine, Canada, and New Brunswick, and their culture is very different 
from what uh, the traditional Native, Native American image looks like. The Mi'kmaq people are whaling people. They'll go out, they'll hunt whales in canoes, and they have a very different style uh, lodging that they live in. Everything is very different than what you would think of. But every summer I have the opportunity to spend time with my family at a place called Coldstream Pond up in Maine. And it's up there that you can hear the birds, the Maine loons calling to each other across the lake at night. If you listen in the still of the evening, you can hear one, flute, one, uh, one loon just call out. And then somewhere way across the lake, you hear an answer in the distance. Thank you. So before I begin talking a little bit about the process that we went through to make this film a possibility, I have time for about two questions uh, at this point. Does anyone have any questions about the project or anything that I've talked about so far? All right, well then I will continue and I'll take questions at the end. But uh, to really go back at the start of this project, it all started with, with a song. It started with a sound. And I was in New York recording uh, a couple tracks for a project that we were going to, myself and my co-producer, Lance Bendixson, were going to be pitching for a documentary series. And as we started doing this music, as I mentioned in the film, it really started to become something more than we thought it would be. So we started recording it with the traditional Native American instruments and then would bring in different artists along with us and we wanted to take the traditional Native American words of wisdom from Chief Joseph, from Chief Seattle, um, from different uh, Native American women like Morning Dove, and to be able to share their voice as well. And we realized, after we'd been in this project for about a year and a half, the true importance of what we were doing. We were very excited to get a company called Brand USA involved with us, which helped provide funding as well as uh, travel for a lot of these locations that we went to. Working with Brand USA was an amazing experience because we were able to work together to tell the stories of these different locations uh, like Acadia National Park, uh, Totem Bright State Park, as well as Muscle Shoals, Alabama. If you ever get a chance to look at a documentary about Muscle Shoals, there's only one that you'll find but uh, I believe it's on Netflix and Amazon Prime, you'd be amazed at the music that has come out of that small area. If you saw, it looked like two older gentlemen sitting on a couch there. Those two guys, Aretha, Fra Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, Mick Jagger, Leonard Skinner, uh, even the Beatles, I believe, went down to Muscle Shoals, and they expected all of these huge famous musicians from around the world to be playing there, but it was just these local people that grew up in Muscle Shoals that created this music that you hear on a worldwide stage. And we feel very blessed to have uh, had a chance to work with them in the project. So going over uh, this project really inspired me to write my thesis about the culture connection that we have, about this connectedness to music, to the earth, to physical locations. And I was able to go through a little bit different research process for this project than I have with other things. While I did do research uh, with existing books that were out there, different online databases, and talking to some of the experts in the field, the thing that I really wanted to capture was the stories 
and the firsthand accounts from Native American leaders, from Native American elders, that many people don't get a chance to hear. So much of what I wrote about came from personal interviews. And projects, to me like this, uh, take on a really special importance within the Native American community. Because if we don't have our stories, then our histories fade away. You saw a gentleman uh, named James Neptune in the film who was an elder talking about the Penobscot River. Uh, I interviewed him for my thesis project after we did the film together. And uh, I interviewed him in May, and he passed away last month. And uh, the thesis was one of the last things that uh, we talked about together. And it just goes to show that these stories, these elders, they're passing away. And as time continues, if the stories don't continue, like up in Ketchikan, if the dances don't continue, if they don't continue to educate their children, then this culture will fade away. So that's why I really wanted to create something special with a culture connection that we have within the travel industry. What's actually interesting is if you look at certain markets in Europe, there's a Native American recording artist that's a friend of mine named Shelley Morningsong, and she's contracted every year to spend a month in Germany because the German people, believe it or not, are crazy for authentic Native American culture. They have travel experiences in Germany where you can go out and hunt the traditional Native American way. You can live in teepees and you can experience Native American song, culture, and dance over there. Uh, same thing with Japan and China. They're bringing in Native American artists over there so that they can experience the authentic culture. At the Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico, again, Shelley Morningsong was talking about art walks that they have, where what they will do is they'll have local artists that will set up shops in their houses and the general public can come in follow this path that's been marked along the ground and they get a chance to go into these artists' houses to talk with them, to engage with them and see why they create the artwork that they do, how it's done and even take some of that home with them. So it's this connection to authenticity that really drew me to coming at this project from that personal approach, is people crave authenticity. You can sell tons of made in China dream catchers but it doesn't mean that you're gonna get anywhere. But if you bring someone into a place, you let them experience something truly unique, it'll differentiate you from anywhere else in the marketplace. And not only that, it'll create a lasting impression within that person that'll inspire positive change. So this connection that I talk about is not just using Native American reservations or holy sites or locations as a tourist trap and where you come in where you buy merchandise. <coughs> But this is something that is a living, breathing partnership within Native American communities. As an example of this, uh, at Zuni Pueblo, there's a recent program that was installed. And what this is, is if people want to experience traditional Native American life on the reservation, they can come to the Tribal Cultural Center on the reservation, and they'll be sent into a different elders or different uh, Native American individual's home. And that Native American individual will do traditional songs and dance, cook them a traditional meal, and take small groups of individuals into their homes to be able to tell them these stories. And these experiences are really something that you can't find anywhere else in the world. And they're really important on a cultural aspect as well. So if you look at the, the project that I was working on with the film, with my thesis, it was really about two things. Number one, showing passions and how you can use a passion to make a positive difference in communities and to bring communities together. And number two, to show why there's an importance to physical locations, to be able to draw people there, to tell those stories, to help gain an advantage in the United States travel industry as well. At this point, I'd love to open up for any questions that you might have, and I'll be sticking around too for a few minutes uh, after the presentation. So if you have any other questions that you maybe didn't think of until the end, I'll be over here for a little while as well. Are there any questions? Yes. How did you first become acquainted with the flute? So I tell people that the flute actually found me when I was 13 years old. So I was on a family vacation in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I was going uh, from storefront to storefront, and I found a little $40 flute, and I picked it up, I looked at it, and I said, I'm never going to do anything with this. But I thought it was kind of cool. So I bought it. And about a week later, I went to Mesa Verde National Park. And I went to go see the old Anastasi cliff dwellings that were there. 
while I was there, I asked the tour guide if I could play a little bit of flute near the edge of the canyon just to see what it would sound like. And he responded by announcing to the entire tour group <laughs> that there was a young recording artist from Nashville, Tennessee that was going to give an impromptu concert <laughs> on the edge of the cliff where they can push me off if I don't do well. <laughs> Did I mention I was 13 and had the flute for a week at the time? So you can imagine how scared I was. But as soon as I started to play, the fear just melted away and something just felt right and it clicked and that feeling has never gone away. Are there any more questions? We've got time for about uh, two more. Yes. In the movie, you have a lot of drone footage and uh, you have those wild horses. How did you, like, did you print them there, or how did you get to catch them on, on camera? That's actually a great question. So those horses are actually at a wild horse preserve that's not far from Muscle Shoals, Alabama. So they take these Mustangs and they'll bring them there. And this is not like people will take them in there and then they'll sell them or do anything. This is a safe place for the horses to come to. So we were fortunate enough to have the film crew go out and to work with the individuals that own that property and they allowed us to bring in the drone and do some of that footage there. Uh, some of the footage that you didn't see is they had a bunch of, I believe they put apples in the back of a pickup truck and had people sitting in the truck <laughs> with, a, with a camera and the horses were charging at them. So. That was pretty good access. <laughs> yes, and speaking of that, I will say probably the most challenging aspect of the entire project was me trying to walk up that slippery cliff with the drum on my back. We almost didn't make it to the end of the filming. I'll just put it that way. Do <laughs> you make any of your um, I get asked that question all the time, and I always say the same answer. I half made one that's halfway decent, and the half that's decent I didn't make. What, 300 or so? What did you sell? Um, I play about 10 different variations of uh, ethnic woodwind instruments, so Native American flutes, uh, and then South American, East Asian, Southeast Asian. But uh, I have, I want to say, around 60 different flutes in my collection that I use for soundtrack work. And you had a question in the back. So, what got you so interested in looking into your culture? Because I know there are like, well, all of them from different cultural backgrounds, not everybody wants to like, go into and like, research their culture and learn about it. So, what really inspired you for that? Definitely. That's an awesome question. So, for me, I draw strength from the people that have come before me. And uh, family history is always something that's been incredibly, uh, a huge source of passion for me. And when you look to the past and you see the actions and the strength of other people, it helps you when you feel lost. If you feel like, I don't have a voice, I don't know what I'm going to do in this world, what's my passion? Take a look at the people that have come before you and see what their passion was. Uh, one of my ancestors, his name is Jason Russell. I have a new project that I'm working on about him as well. And he was the very first Minuteman that was killed in the Revolutionary War. So the day after Paul Revere's ride, he was gunned down on his doorstep and stabbed 11 times with bayonets. And they said that the blood was so deep in his kitchen floor that it was ankle deep. And people can forget sometimes where we come from. And if you look at a history in a textbook, it may not mean that much. But when you take a personal approach to it and you can connect it with who you are, that's when history comes alive. And that's when you can repeat some, some things that are beneficial. Time for one more question, I believe. Just one more question. <laughs> Somebody's got something. Yes. How does this project uh, change you or your view about the topic? Well, we don't have time to answer that question, but um, <laughs> in, a, in a very brief uh, summary, it's been incredibly eye opening. Um, on one aspect, I was able to learn a lot about my own culture and to learn about the cultures of people that are connected uh, to my heritage, which was amazing uh, for me. And on a side note, to be able to record with the same symphony that was on all the Star Wars movies and go see some of the lightsabers that were there at George Lucas's house, I totally nerded out. I'm not going to lie. So if it was just for that, it would be worth it as well. But thank you all so much for having me today. Thank you.